in the 21st century, and I'm uh, speaking more broadly with regards to churches, um, not only in this country but around the world, I think we could agree that um, New Testament Christianity has uh, taken a wide swing away from what we read in the Bible. I think we can agree with that. And so for us as a church, uh, we must be concerned with biblical Christianity, uh, with what we find the church to be doing in the first century, and that we as a church in the 21st century uh, would concern ourselves with the same things. And so um, we're continuing here. We find ourselves in Paul's uh, second missionary journey. We know the first missionary journey. Uh, we saw some churches established. Uh, people come uh, to faith in Christ. Uh, churches being uh, established with uh, leadership there. And on the second missionary journey, Paul is going back to those churches that have been established and he is encouraging them, strengthening them in the faith. And as he goes through uh, Derby and Lystra and Iconium, he continues in Asia Minor and goes all the way west of Asia, which is present-day Turkey. And he arrives in Troas, and uh, we know that the Lord prevented him from either going north or south. And so finally he gets to the place where he, there's nowhere west anymore to go. He needs direction from God, and then he gets a vision of a Macedonian man who has a, a, a simple, um, a, 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 a simple words, help us. That was the, the words of the Macedonian man. And so Paul receives direction from God and he sails through the Aegean Sea and he goes westward. He uh, gets to Decapolis and then from Decapolis he goes over to Philippi. And we uh, spoke at Philippi. His arrival in Philippi was not the, uh, what we find in the ministry of the Apostle Paul was not typical. When he arrives in Philippi, he basically was there for a certain amount of days and we don't find him preaching. Uh, it is evident from our text that there is no synagogue in Philippi. It was a Roman colony, a Roman city. So either two reasons are possible. They were either not allowed to form a synagogue, or there were not enough Jewish families to form a synagogue. And so Paul, as he would typically do, he would first go on the Sabbath to a synagogue with the intent to preach the gospel to them, but there was no such synagogue in, in uh, Philippi. And so he goes, he hears about a place of prayer outside of the city by the river, and he goes there, and he goes there at the hour of prayer, and he ends up speaking to the women that had congregated there for the time of prayer, and he speaks of Christ, and we know that the women that he was talking to uh, made a no decision, but Lydia was listening in on the conversation, and she came to faith in Christ. She was baptized, and then she invited there uh, Paul and Silas and the men that were traveling with them, and really that's where the first church was formed, in the house of Lydia. We know that because by the end of chapter 16, we'll get there, after Paul uh, is uh, free from prison, they go back to the house of Lydia to meet with the brethren there. And so it seems that Lydia's house was the place where the church at Philippi was first started. We continue in our text here, and what we find after the initial, so far what we know is there's been one convert in Philippi, Lydia. And now we continue in our text in Acts chapter 16. We're going to begin reading uh, in verse 16, and let's see here, there's more happenings in Philippi, and as I've been reminded, as we've been reminded that the book of Acts is not everything that happened in the first century churches, but it is everything that God wants us to know that happened, and so we can learn some things from it. Notice Acts 16, verse 16, the Bible says, and it came to pass as we went to prayer. Now, you remember, they went that first time to the, ti to the time of prayer, and I believe that now they're going there consistently. Uh, on the Sabbath, uh, whoever was uh, Jew in that area, they would go there every Sabbath and pray. And I think that Paul there is going there consistently, time and time again, to the time of prayer. And something is going to happen. And notice here, 
what, what is going to be really a simple start to the day is going to end up to be a very troublesome day. A lot of affliction on this particular day. Notice, it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when the masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. What a change in Paul's plans. He goes from going to the place of prayer to casting out an evil spirit, to being physically grabbed, to be brought before the magistrates, the judges of those days, to be falsely accused, to be beaten, and to be end up in prison. I don't think that when Paul started that day, he thought it would go that way. But notice verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. I want to preach this morning on this truth as we think about the ministry of Paul. I want to maybe take away a different emphasis from the ministry of Paul. There are certainly many things we could talk about. I, I, I want to emphasize maybe on a more practical level what we read here. And I want to uh, preach on responding to difficulties. Responding to difficulties. As we begin in our passage, we would say that it's a normal day for Paul. He's doing something regularly. He is not expecting anything different to happen. And we find that his day is going to be quite different than no doubt he anticipated. And uh, by the time it's all said and done, we have uh, really an example in the life of Paul. And God is going to, God is going to use this difficulty, uh, this opposition, whatever you want to label it, and God is going to use that for His glory. Amen. For His glory. Uh, as we begin here in our text in verse 16, it seems here that more time has expired in Philippi since the first convert. Lydia had heard Paul speak to women at the time of prayer outside the city. And it seems evident from the scriptures here in our text that Paul continued to go to the place of prayer outside the city. If you notice verse 16, and it came to pass. So since Lydia's conversion and baptism... More time has gone. Uh, it seems here that again, as I mentioned last week, that the ministry of Paul in Philippi is slow. He is not preaching to a great crowd of people. It seems that they're having individual encounters and individual conversation with, with uh, different people. And so here in our text, we see that more time expires and it seems to be very slow in Philippi. And compared to the cities that Paul had gone to thus far, it is a different type of city because it's mainly comprised as a Roman colony with Roman soldiers and with Roman citizens. We see here that the Bible says we went to prayer in verse 16. So this is not them just praying. The Bible says they went to prayer. And so no doubt here this is a reference to the appointed place of prayer that Paul had already gone to 
and he keeps going back to that place. There is no doubt that they would use this time, no doubt, to pray, but they also use this time to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ, as noted earlier in Lydia's conversion. However, here something happens on this specific day, which took a, what I would refer to as a dramatic turn. This is a dramatic turn. Uh, the following events really cannot be attributed to Paul's preaching. Remember, when he went to Lystra in Asia, because of his preaching, he was driven out of the city stone and left for dead. That was because of his preaching. However, the dramatic turn on this day is not going to happen because of his preaching. There is no record here of him preaching thus far in Philippi. I want to course out the events. They're going to be followed by a young lady possessed with a spirit. Uh, she's going to cry out some things. We'll read about that. And then Paul is going to cast out the spirit out of her. Then they're going to be seized by men of authority. They're going to be falsely accused. They're going to be judged. Um, uh, Paul and Silas are going to be beaten. And the word beaten here would be idea with many stripes, they would take rods or sticks, or you could probably, the equivalent today would be a baseball bat, and they would beat them. And then they're going to be put in prison. So here I see that Paul did not expect this to happen. That was not his plan. I, I don't think that Paul started his day saying, well, I want a lady to scream at us all day, and then I want to be beaten, and then I want to be imprisoned. That was not his plan. And so here, once again, we can learn something valuable, not just about Paul's ministry, although there are many applications there, but for this morning's message, I want to talk about Paul's spiritual character. It is good at this time to be reminded that our days can also take a dramatic or an unexpected turn. Have you ever had such a day in your life? These events teach us something often about ourselves. We should not try to avoid unexpected changes in our lives because really they're inevitable. They're going to happen at some point. Rather, we should learn to respond to any unexpected change with the help of God. And it is often in those unexpected changes that reveal either the, the depth or the shallowness of our spirituality. You see, we must not become frustrated with our failed responses of the past, but we should learn from it thanking God when He reveals to us any weakness in our lives. You see, failure not to become, uh, not to, uh, a failure should not become an excuse for us to give up. Failure should become an opportunity to learn from our failures as to not repeat them. And so, have you ever had a dramatic turn or something unexpected happen in your life and then it taught you something about yourself that you didn't know was there, but it was really there? You see, these difficulties teach us something about ourselves. And when we are taught those things, we must respond accordingly so as to learn from them. Now I want to, first of all, as we look at our text, we see, first of all, the unpleasant opposition in Philippi. There's really uh, four things that would cause, I think, Paul some uh, frustration, some um, spiritual turmoil, uh, some emotional even uh, difficulties, uh, and even some physical pain. All those are going to happen on this day. As we think about the unpleasant opposition in Philippi, first of all, we see the frustration with the damsel. Now, the Bible here, the reason I refer to her as the damsel is because the Bible does so. In verse 16, the Bible says, A certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Now, the idea of a damsel is, first of all, this is a woman. The idea of a damsel is also is a young woman. And also, the idea of a damsel is that she is a servant. She, uh, she is at somebody else's disposal. And so here, this woman, this young woman, the Bible describes her as being possessed with a spirit of divination. And she 
brought her master's gain, much gain with soothsaying. We could say the equivalent today, she would be a palm reader. She would have some message from a spirit. And so there, uh, there was a wide application. There was different types of practices. But And by the way, it hasn't changed today. Uh, somebody wants some word or some revelation about the future, about what's going to happen or uh, some uh, spiritual saying or, or something of that nature. And so this uh, woman ha is being used as a tool. And in that area in Philippi, in that city, she is known to be a soothsaying lady. Now, I say here the frustration is sometimes we come to this text and somebody might say, well, look at what she said. Notice verse 17. The same, that's the damsel, followed Paul and, uh, and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, let me ask you this. Is what she said true? It is. Notice the words. These men are servants of the Most High God. Is that true? Yes. Which show unto us the way of salvation. Is that true? Yes. So what is frustrating? Notice we read in verse 18, And this did she many days, but Paul being grieved. And so we might pause at this time and think to ourselves, Okay, this damsel is speaking the truth. And yet Paul is grieved by what she is saying, because this would happen day after day after day. Now I want you to notice in our text, in verse 16, the Bible says, When they came to prayer, a certain damsel with a spirit of divination met us. So the idea here of what's going on is that uh, on particular times, on particular days, Paul would go to that place of prayer where they would regularly meet. And apparently our text indicates that this woman knew that Paul and Silas would be there at that particular time and she met them there. And so when she would see Paul and Silas there, she would say those words. These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And then the Bible says that she did this many days. Now, the text indicates to us that Paul didn't do anything about it for many days. That time and time again, when Paul would go to the place of prayer, this woman would meet them day after day after day, scream the same words about them, and that, would go, that went on day after day after day. And Paul didn't do anything about it, but the Bible says he was grieved. Now we ask ourselves, okay, what she said is true. Why is the Apostle Paul grieved? The Apostle Paul is grieved because of who she is. Yes, she is speaking the truth, but it's coming from the wrong mouth. In other words, this woman has a reputation in that city. And so Paul see that what she... Now some people have said, oh, she is, uh, she is making fun of what they're saying. She is mocking them. I don't believe so. There is nothing in the text that indicates to us that she was making fun of it. In the book of Acts, we know that there are times when the Bible says that they were mocked. Jesus was mocked, or the disciples were mocked. The Bible doesn't mention here any mocking. The problem that Paul has is not the mockery. I don't think there is any. The problem that Paul has with this woman is what she is known for. And the apostle Paul, who by the way seeks to be validated in the eyes of people that he is indeed speaking the truth, he cannot have this woman to continue to say those things. Why? Because she is known as a soothsaying lady to be associated with the spirit world. And the message that she has brought in the past has been a false message. And so Paul here is frustrated and he is grieved not because she is saying the wrong thing, but because of what he is beginning to be associated with. So... I want, let's put ourselves in, let's put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the Apostle Paul. If that were you and you went into the out of prayer, and then there would be this lady standing behind you. These are servants of the Most High God. And they show us the way of salvation. And she's standing behind Paul and Paul's trying to talk. These men are servants of the Most High God. And uh, they're showing us the way of salvation. And, and, and people are starting to look at Paul's like, who's this crazy lady? <laughs> 
We know this lady with the spirits. We know this is a soothsaying lady. But Paul has allowed it day after day after day after day. And so finally, and so that must have been frustrating. Can you imagine somebody screaming behind you those things day after day after day? And you're becoming associated with this person? That must have been frustrated. Frustrating. It would be frustrating just to hear the screaming. But it would also be frustrating because you don't want to associate with this woman. So we see the frustration with the damsel, but then it turns, as you continue reading, so Paul in verse 18, he commanded the spirit out of her in the name of Jesus Christ, and the spirit came out the same hour. Now notice here what happens, we change here in verse 19, and when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. Now, we here uh, see that uh, the second area of unpleasant opposition at Philippi would be not only the frustration with the damsel, but also now would be the accusation of the masters. Uh, those men evidently were taking advantage of this woman. Uh, they were now upset with Paul and Silas. Why? Because the spirit was cast out of her. And the Bible says in verse 19, they saw that the hope of their gains was gone. They were making a lot of money off of her soothsaying. And by the way, today, if you want a palm reader, they'll take a lot of money from you and tell you nothing. Right? What do they say? Well, uh, you're going to have a friend that's going to be upset with you. Well, that's possible in all of our lives, every day of our lives, for the rest of our lives. <laughs> but that's how people make money today. And so they're, they're upset because they're not going to make any money anymore. And out of that anger towards uh, Paul and Silas, they're going to accuse them of doing something uh, that they were not doing. And now, why do I say that? Well, later in our text... In, um, notice verse uh, 19 and 20, or, uh, yeah, 19 through 21. Notice they says, they brought them to the magistrate saying, these men, being Jews, do exceeding trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. Now it's interesting because, Paul has done no public preaching in the city up to, to what we know. He just cast the spirit out of this woman. And so now they're constructing a false accusation. Now we know this is a false accusation because later in Acts 16 verse 37, when they were let go, Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly uncondemned. In other words, Paul didn't do anything legally that was against the law. But yet they brought an accusation that Paul was troubling the city, that he was teaching customs to the Romans that they ought not to do as Romans. And so that's another point of frustration for Paul. He has been trying to establish a testimony and a good reputation in the city. And so he has first of all been associated with this woman who he doesn't want to associate with. And then now he's being falsely accused from some of the uh, uh, the Bible calls them masters, but people who had some type of authority in the city, and now there's a kind of a reputation going around Paul. Well, he is teaching customs that are unlawful. He is doing the wrong thing. And there's a multitude that's gathering. Can you imagine the frustration of Paul in this false accusation? We also go further. We see the condemnation of the magistrates in verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Now notice what happens. Those rulers, they're accusing Paul of Silas of doing something that they have not done. And everybody in the multitude, they're listening to, to them. And now there's a multitude that forms. Can you see kind of the crowd gathering around Paul and Silas? Uh, jeering at them, mocking them, criticizing them. Let's rid ourselves of them. And they, this crowd pushes them before the magistrates who would be in that day, that would take uh, 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 a place in the open air. And they were condemned. They commanded, notice, for them to be beaten. We see in 
the magistrates who had the authority to condemn those who committed crimes. It is interesting that Paul later says when they realize that Paul is a Roman, they're in trouble. Why? Because under the law, you can't beat a man who is uncondemned. There was no crime committed. But yet here, there's the condemnation of the magistrates. That would be a point of great frustration. Judge, you would think that a judge would be fair, that a judge would be impartial, that a judge would weigh the evidence, but there has been no evidence. And the judge, notice, what, what is he responding to? He is responding to the crowd. He is a people pleaser. That's not a right judge. That's frustrating, isn't it? We say, crazy lady. We see false accusation. We see injustice. And then we see, finally, the affliction of the multitude. Verse 23 of Acts 16. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. They were beaten. The, the Bible says, notice our text says, many stripes was laid upon them. Now, let me tell you, that was very painful for Paul and Silas to go through that. What a day. Emotional exhaustion, mental exhaustion, physical exhaustion, physical pain, spiritual distress. We may have lost our reputation. We may have lost the opportunity to have an impact in the city of Philippi. And so we see here, this is an unpleasant opposition in Philippi. But then we come and we, we see this unpleasant opposition. This was not what Paul had planned. Have you ever had a bad day where everything seems to come crashing down all at once. It seems to not happen over time, but there's one day where it all happens. That's what it was for Paul. Rough day. So we see the unpleasant opposition in Philippi, but then we see the commendable response to the opposition. So this is simple, but yet it's so profound and deep and helpful for us in verse 25 and at midnight. Now, we don't know how much time has expired between the time they were beaten to the time that they're, it's midnight. Verse 24 says, when they received, when the jailer received the charge, he thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the socks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So, what we find here is this, this is the response, and, and someone may say, well, that's, that's, just, that's just too simple. What do they do? How do they respond? After such an exhausting day, emotionally, physically, spiritually, they do two things. They sing, and they pray. Now, now what, what, what does that mean? You think about singing and praying. Well, let's talk about, first of all, notice in verse 25, at midnight Paul and Silas prayed. I, I want you to, first of all, notice that after this long day, now it's midnight. That means it's late. I don't know how you are, but when it gets late, there's some things you just don't want to do. You're exhausted by a day, and this is not, a, not just a typical work day where you would already be exhausted, but this has been a trying day. Many difficulties. As a matter of fact, time and time again, it was back to back to back to back, and now it's midnight. They're exhausted. No doubt, physically, they are exhausted. And this would be the perfect time for them to say, let's just get some rest here. I mean, I mean, we've, we've gone through enough. There is no doubt there is a need because of men for rest. We all know that. Rest is beneficial to us. Now, too much rest can be dangerous for us. 
But rest nonetheless in itself is good because it brings life back into our bodies. But there is also an aspect where Paul and Silas understand that there is another priority. They need another type of refreshment at this time. And this is a spiritual refreshment. And how do you get spiritually refreshed? Well, there is the supplication of prayer and there is the song of praise. At Menai, Paul and Silas, they prayed. Now, if we're not careful, we'll say, okay, they prayed, and let's move on. What's ha what happens next? Well, well, wait a minute. They prayed. The prayer is not recorded for us. We, we don't know what they said. But the Bible just lets us know that they prayed. We would say here this would not be a conducive time to prayer. They're in the open. They're shackled. They're in the sight of other prisoners. They're in the prison. And so this is not a time to pray. You know, you have to find a time where you have to go apart in privacy and spend some time in prayer. And I agree, that's a good thing to do. But they don't have the opportunity at privacy. But yet they spend some time in prayer. You see, prayer is what? Prayer is simply this. When we pray, the act of praying is simply us declaring our dependence upon God. Paul and Silas go through a trying day, and the first thing they do in response at midnight, before they go to sleep, they say, well, God, we need you. That's what prayer is. In its simplest form, prayer is saying, God, we need you. Now, it's interesting here because when you, when you study the, the book of Acts, when you study the prayer of the churches and of the believers, I don't find, you may find a reference, I haven't found any reference to it, you don't find any believers asking for the persecution to cease. Now when they were persecuted, you see them asking for boldness. You see them asking that God would help them to be faithful. You see them asking God to help them Rejoice in difficulty. And here's the wonderful thing about prayer. You see, prayer teaches us that not necessarily us getting to the place where we're asking God to take away the affliction, to take away the difficulty. We're there to ask God to help us in the difficulty, to learn to rejoice, to learn to look to God, to learn to be dependent on Him in the middle of the difficulty. And that's when we learn to depend on God. You see, we often learn not to depend on God because we find that most of the time we don't need Him. At least we think we don't. And it is in the time of that affliction that he finds time to pray in dependence on God, the supplication of prayer. If God wanted us to have that prayer, He would have had it for us, but He just tells us what they did. They prayed. They not only prayed, but this would be, we, would, we might think that as believers that prayer would be the natural thing. God help us, okay? But then they sing. Now that's peculiar to me. Do you see what happened? Rough day. Uh, my wife uh, says, she says this to me. I can't remember how long it was. Uh, I was singing through the house, and she said, uh, so I, I know you're in good mood. And I said, why? So because you're singing. When you're in a good mood, you sing. When you're not in a good mood, you don't sing. It's often reflective of your, your attitude and your spirit. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to notice with me, we ask ourselves here, we uh, rejoice, sing, we think about saying. The idea of singing is connected to the idea of rejoicing and uh, praising God. In uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, the Bible says, he, he instructs the believers not to be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And notice what he says in verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 5, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks to always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you to notice here the text says, speaking to who? Yourselves. 
And so here you, we ask ourselves here, how can they sing? Well, they are speaking to themselves in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and notice, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Question, question. Can, could Paul sing really well? I don't know and I don't care. But they sang. What is singing? Making a melody in your heart to the Lord. Singing to yourselves. He says in verse 20 of Ephesians 5, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father. Now I want you to notice here, don't, don't misunderstand. Um, Paul is not going to say, Oh, I just, I just love being beaten. And I just love, thank you God for the beating. And thank you God for, no, no. Giving thanks always for all things unto God. We don't, th Paul didn't thank God for the beating. He thanked God for God in the beating. There's a difference. So, That's a commendable response to the opposition, rejoicing in the Lord. Now, the Bible says, throws it in there, the prisoners heard them. Can you imagine, put yourself in the shoes of the prisoners. What are they doing? They've lost their mind. They're kooky. Like, what are they doing? Singing and praying? And here's... Not only them doing that, but they stand here as an audience of that response. How can they do that in such a time? They've been labeled as crazy by identity. They've been falsely accused. Uh, they've been condemned. Uh, they've been afflicted, physically afflicted. And here they are uh, praying and singing. They've lost their minds. At this point, and by the way, I, I would like to point out that the praying and the singing did not take place after the conversion of the Philippian, Philippian jailer. It took place before they even knew it would happen. Which brings us to the last one. That is the opportunity found in opposition. So... Thus far, all that we know, now there might have been more, but that's all we know in the text. There's been one convert, her name is Lydia, a seller of purple, a businesswoman. She comes to faith in Christ, is baptized, allow Paul and Silas to meet in the house. They probably had already had some meetings there. We know that because when he leaves prison, he goes right to her house to meet with the brethren. So it seemed that that was a pattern. And they were falsely accused, they were uh, unjustly condemned, and then they were physically beaten. And so Paul doesn't know what's going to happen, but we find him praying and singing, rejoicing, thanking the Lord. How can he do that? Well, I think that Paul has a sense, has to have a sense, that so far the work in Philippi has been slow. So far, really nothing spectacular has been done. At least not like the day of Pentecost where 3,000 people got saved. Not like Peter when he went to the house of Cornelius and the, house, the entire house came to a saving knowledge of Christ. Nothing spectacular has happened. There's been one convert so far. And so it seems that the work at Philippi has been hindered. And yet we know the rest of our text. We're going to study it next week. But for purpose of this message... That night when they're praying and singing, there's going to be an earthquake. And the earthquake is going to lose them from their bands. It's going to swing the door wide open. And the Roman soldier who's standing outside the gate thinks that as he wakes up in the middle of this, after the earthquake, he thinks that everybody is gone. And so as a Roman soldier, he knows what that means for him. What does that mean? Well, if a Roman a soldier was entrusted with prisoners, if prisoners were, were lost under his authority, he would be killed and lose his life. So that's why he's going to kill himself, because he knows, I'm going to die. The prisoners are gone. My life is over. 
We know this man has a family, but he doesn't want to go through this. He'd rather, he'd rather kill himself right now. And Paul says, no, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. Now, the Roman centurion, we'll see uh, next week, that he's going to uh, declare here, he, he's going to cry, uh, cry out uh, to Paul and Silas. And he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, I want you to understand here that thus far, nobody has been crying out to Paul, running to Paul and Silas, says, hey, what must we do to be saved? Hey, we've heard your preaching. We've heard your speaking to the woman. What must we do to be saved? But after this difficult day, this hard and difficult day, they learn in that moment when everything has gone wrong for them. They learn in that moment to pray to God and to sing unto God and to rejoice in that moment of difficulty. And it is in that moment that God will use a a, a transformational moment to happen in the life of that Roman soldier who's been hearing them pray, who has been hearing them sing, and now after this earthquake, he thinks that his life is over and he's going to realize that Christ is the answer in that moment. He was about to lose his life. Everything was about to be over for him. And so he gets to the place where he has heard what Paul said. The only reason for him to ask that question, what must I do to be saved, is because he's already heard something about that. But do you see how that opportunity happened? It happened in a very bad day. No converse for Paul that day. Nothing but bad after bad after bad after bad. But at the end of the day, despite a horrible day, God can take a horrible day and use it for His glory. Amen. So here is the message, and we're done. The problem we must not focus on is not the difficulties of the day. That is not the issue. The issue is not God who allows that to happen in our lives. The issue is how we respond. Now the temptation in our lives is to do this. is to blame the day. Look at my life. Look at everything that's gone wrong in my life. Well, if God loved me, He wouldn't let that happen. Well, well wait. Have you maybe missed what the scriptures teach and that God can use such a day and if you learn to rejoice in Him despite that day that God can use that as an opportunity for His glory. Again, are we more interested in earthly comforts than the glory of God? We must ask ourselves that question. So it is evident here that Paul responded in the right way to difficulty. I'm impressed with Paul, not just because he was a wonderful preacher. I say impressed is because of the example he lays for us. Not because he was a mighty preacher, but because he was also a mighty Christian. Now we may not all be preachers, but we can all be Christians and live the Christian life. And that's what Paul did here.